But you also realize again, all of the small things we take for granted that, that involve hundreds and thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of different people all coordinating and working together without knowing one another, without talking to one another. And it gets you and I and millions of other consumers around the world goods and services which improve our well-being with no one centrally directing it. And in fact, if you tried to centrally direct it, it would be a disaster. And that's one of the things that these examples, I think, highlight. When you try to get one person doing everything, it really ends up being a, being a mess. And welcome to the Essential Scholars podcast. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about the Austrian School of Thought. I'm joined by Christopher Coyne, uh, the Associate Director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Pol Philosophy, Politics, and Economics, and the F.A. Harper Professor of Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He's also a Professor of Economics and Director of Graduate Studies in the Economics Department at George Mason University. He specializes in Austrian economics, economic development, emerging democracies, post-war and disaster reconstruction, political economy, and social change. So this makes him an excellent guest for today's discussion. Welcome, Chris. Well, thank you for, for having me. It's good to see you. It's good to see you as well. So how do we distill a school of thought that's been around for well over 100 years into its essential components? And, and you know what, what are the essential components of the Austrian school of thought? Sure. Well, it's it's a it's a task, uh, and and this is a, a joint project with my colleague Pete Betke, uh, who I work with here at George Mason University. And the challenge, of course, as you put it quite nicely, was to distill down an entire school of thought uh, that that has a very deep and rich history into uh, you know twenty thousand words and and uh, kind of providing an overview. And so what Pete and I did was to attempt to. Uh, provide an overview both of the the history of the school, but also some of the the key concepts as well. Um, starting, of course, with with the Marginal Revolution um, and Karl Menger. So, what is the Marginal Revolution? Because it's not just important to the Austrian school; it's pretty important to economics in general. Yeah, and, and so interestingly, you know, obviously, it's a good place to start because that's the origins of the school. But it's also interesting because many people today have it in their heads that Austrian economics, the Austrian school of economics is, is heterodox. And certainly aspects of it are relative to what's considered mainstream economics. But that also runs the risk of neglecting the, the very deep history and ties to the economics profession, um, history of economic thought and the development of economic thought that, that Austrian economists were central to. And that begins with the marginal revolution. And so the marginal revolution is a uh, paradigm shift in economics that occurred in the late 1800s. And there were three co-founders of the marginal revolution. They were working independently and they, they came across this concept of marginalism. And so you had uh, William Stanley Jevons, who was working in England. You had Leon Walra, who was working in Switzerland. And you had Karl Menger, who was working in Austria. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, each of them independently came up with this idea of marginalism. And so to understand marginalism, you have to understand what this paradigm shift, this revolution uh, did, which was up to that time, the dominant approach to economics was the labor theory of value. So the value of goods and services, according to the labor theory of value, was dependent on the amount of labor or effort required to produce them. Things that took longer to produce were more valuable, according to this theory. And what the marginal revolution uh, revolutionists said is, well, wait a second, value is not based on the amount of labor that is expended, but rather how useful people perceive the, the good or service. So to put it in contemporary terms, you know, a, a smartphone today is not uh, valued or, or not expensive in monetary terms because it took a certain number of hours to produce, but rather because consumers value what it can do for them in terms of achieving their ends. And so marginalism, when we talk about marginal analysis, it's focusing on the additional unit of a good or service. Uh, and that became the dominant way of thinking. And it was able to resolve par uh, numerous paradoxes, one of them being the, the water diamond paradox. Mm 
Can you talk a little bit about the water diamond paradox in the book? Um, and so one question I have is, so Austrian economics and neoclassical economics were kind of born in that same moment. Does the Austrian theory of value differ at all from the neoclassical theory of value? Yeah, so it's interesting. Neo meaning new, so new classical followed the old classical economists. The old classical economists were the ones who subscribed to the labor theory of value. And interestingly, the term neoclassical economics was coined by an economist by the name of Thorsten Veblen. Uh, and he coined that term in a 1900 article, article written in 1900. In that article, he combines all the marginalists together. So he included the, the Austrian school in that. So, so to his way of thinking, Menger was a, a neoclassical economist, and that's how um, the early Austrians viewed themselves. It wasn't until later on, and we're going to talk about economic calculation in a little bit, so I won't get into too much, but it wasn't until that debate that really a, a, a wedge between neoclassical economics and the Austrians kind of came to the forefront. Um, but what made Menger unique among the neoclassical economists was his focus on subjectivism and his focus on the subjective nature of value. And so while all of the, the co-revolutionaries, the three people I mentioned earlier, recognized the importance of marginalism, what Menger did was he stressed that it's not just marginal decision-making, but it's the way that each individual chooser, chooser interprets the world. And so their subjective interpretation of both the ends they seek to achieve as well as the means that they decide to utilize to achieve those ends are context specific to the chooser. And different people will value those things differently. Uh, and so there's no objective inherent value in things, whether it's the ends themselves or the means, it's how the person who is acting chooses to value them, which is based on their perception of the world. Well, that leads me into my next question. Um, in the chapter on the methodological side of the Austrian school, uh, subjectivism seems to run very deeply through that framework. And one of the assumptions that gets mentioned is that the Austrians view the facts of the social sciences, I'm going to use facts very loosely, um, they view them as something that is shaped by what people believe and think. So does that mean that the facts of the social sciences are subjective as well? Yes. And so so this is an important point that is really at the core of how Austrian economists, going back to Menger, engage in the, the study of economics. And it's important to understand that Austrians emphasize that economics is a social science with emphasis on the social, social here referring to human beings. That's our, our subject of study. And once you appreciate that, you appreciate it that all economic phenomena that we seek to explain ultimately are traced back to the actions of people, of human beings. Once you recognize that, you recognize that those actions, which are taken by people, are taken because they perceive that those actions will help them achieve some end. That The perception part is key there because what they perceive to be the relevant means to achieve their ends and what they perceive to be the ends they want to achieve and how they value those things might differ from how you or I might value those things. And that's okay. There's nothing good or bad about that. That's just the nature of being a human being in the world. We, we have things we want to accomplish. We have certain means that we take because we assume that they are effective in achieving those ends. And uh, uh, that is really what the, the study of the human sciences or the social sciences is all about. To, to sum this up, it, it, the way we put it in the book, and, and I think the way that is, is consistent with the way the Austrians think about it, the, the purpose of economic study is intelligibility. We want to understand the world. That's in contrast to prediction being the emphasis for the sake of control. Uh, and so you could predict a lot of things, but it would drain the human element of them. And so an example that we talk about in the book that, that Israel Kirzner, who's, who's an Austrian economist, who was a student of Mises's, used, uh, and I think he, he said he got it from Mises, was imagine you were in, a, in Grand Central Station, a uh, train station in New York City, and an alien came down. And the alien uh, was unaware of, of you know, human life on Earth. Uh, 
And the, the aliens uh, stood there and watched what was happening. And then at the end of the week came up with predictions and they could say, well, boxes on wheels come in at 7 a.m. in the morning in one direction and people scurry off. And then at five o'clock in the evening, people scurry back in the other direction, get on these boxes with wheels and go in the other direction. And they do that Monday through Friday, but then on the weekends, they don't do it. You could make very nice predictions. It would be scientific in a way. You could test it. But what you would miss is the concept of commuting, the concept of rush hour, uh, the concept of, well, these people are likely going to work, uh, which is why this happens during the work week, but not on the weekend. These are all concepts and constructs that we have and that we know because we are what we study. We are human beings. And so that's the intelligibility point. In order to understand why people do what they do, in order to understand why the world works the way it does, we need to understand their purposes and plans. And that's why the facts of the social sciences are different than the facts of the natural sciences or physical sciences. We don't have to worry. The chemist doesn't have to worry about uh, you know, an atom getting up and, and leaving the room or uh, uh, changing their behavior because they don't engage in choice the way that you and I do. Yeah, and it seems that prediction without understanding and intelligibility might be dangerous, right? That alien might predict Monday through Friday, people show up and get in the boxes. But, you know, we just had Memorial Day or you know, other holidays might occur. And if they, they will miss, the prediction will be wrong. They'll expect the people to show up if they don't understand the purpose and they won't be able to anticipate when their prediction is incorrect. That's right. And so it's not, and, and just to be clear about this, because I, I don't want to, to, to come across saying the, as, as if this isn't the case, it isn't that Austrians don't believe in prediction. We, we have the law of demand, demand curve slope downwards, people respond to incentives. The point about the facts of the social sciences is that saying people respond to incentives basically means that people respond when costs and benefits change. But, but that says a lot and it says nothing. It says, it says something very broad, but in order to understand how you or I, or some other specific person will change their behavior. We have to understand how they perceive the costs and benefits. So the empirical content comes in, in understanding how specific costs and benefits manifest themselves in specific con contexts as interpreted by people. And so that's the empirical component linked up with, with the predictive general laws of economics. But it seems to, um, you know, it seems like from this framework, it would be not uh, impossible, but unlikely that we would say just because somebody makes a different choice than you or I would have made in that same situation, it doesn't mean that they it doesn't mean that they're irrational. Right, and so uh, you know, one of the points that going back to Ludwig von Mises and his book Human Action, he makes is uh, there's no irrational human action. Uh, the, if you define human action as purposeful action. Now, I realize that's tautological. It's true by you know definition. Uh, and, and so some people would say, well, then you can't rule certain things out. You can't operationalize that. But still, things like that can add value uh, because they help us understand the world rather than saying and imposing my valuations on people, saying that it is irrational for you to do that. You know, And, and this is what a lot of experiments will do. They'll say, well, this person says they want to do X, but then they do Y, so they're irrational. Well, maybe, uh, or maybe they they said something at, at one time, but then when they were actually faced with the costs and benefits, they changed their behavior because they were faced with the costs and benefits. Uh, and so the, in the moment of choice, which is something the Austrians always emphasize, it's the moment of choice when you actually face the costs and benefits that you make the decision. And the, 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 what you said prior or what you say after may not be consistent with that. And that's okay. That's part of being a human being, you know, trying to force human behavior into kind of a robotic type of, of framework uh, and then calling deviations from that uh, irrational uh, misses out on a lot of things. The main one being that we're fallible human beings uh, and we change our mind. We change our behavior all the time. And we make mistakes. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Um, aside from the facts of the social sciences being, you know, uh, what people believe and think, what are some of the other methodological principles that are central to the Austrian framework? Sure. Well, well, one, which is, and this this shows the connection back with economics in general, uh, 
uh, because most economists would believe this, is methodological individualism. So individuals choose. Individuals are our unit of analysis. It's not that they can't participate in groups um, or, or even uh, give decision-making power to other people. People do that all the time. Uh, they'll join a group and then give up decision-making power to someone else in the group. It, it's that uh, all phenomena uh, is ultimately traced back to individual choice. So you have that. Uh, you have the the point about the facts of the social sciences, which you mentioned earlier. And then uh, one of the other overarching kind of themes that you see methodologically, so in an overarching way, is that there's a focus on institutions. Uh, and, and those institutions can be formal. Uh, they can be codified rules uh, but, or, or informal. Um, so, so norms, traditions. Um, and, and one of the things uh, which we can touch upon in more detail later, but I'll, I'll just mention it now, is this uh, focus on what's called spontaneous order or emergent orders, um, which are uh, orders that emerge from purposeful human action. So they're not random, uh, but they're not by design. And this is a very important concept for those working in Austrian economics all the way back to Carl Menger. And you know, one of the really fascinating things about the economics profession, the tra trajectory of the, of the discipline, is that early on, Adam Smith and, and others in that period, uh, they all recognized the importance of, of institutions. Uh, Adam Smith's natural system of liberty uh, and so on, all, all was institutional based. His, his, the idea of the invisible hand all took place in a market context with certain institutions. Then over time, what happens is that as economics becomes increasingly formalized, uh, institutional institutions get kind of sucked out of economic analysis. Uh, and so you have things like the model of complete markets, um, which uh, has a lot of uh, assumptions doing important work, big assumptions. Uh, and then of course you get something called new institutional economics, um, really in the 60s and 70s, although you can trace the origins back of that back earlier. Uh, but uh, the reason that's important is because the role of those institutions had always been crucial to Austrian economists, both in terms of these broader spontaneous orders, but also, again, the, the, the way that people interact with each other uh, is dependent on the institutions within which they are embedded on, in a whole host of ways. Cultural things, who I perceive to be appropriate trading partners, who is perceived in society to be able to do certain types of work. Those are all going to influence the, the types of costs and benefits that people face. And so, again, if our goal is to understand, we have to understand both the formal rules and the informal rules that face choosers, uh, because that's what influences their behavior. Absolutely. How have the methodological principles changed for the Austrian school? Um, are they the same that they were at the beginning when Manger was first formulating his principles or, or have they evolved and shifted? Um, well, you know, the, the core principles are, are the same. So the things we just talked about, there, there have been methodological discussions and developments. And I'm talking here like, you know, economic methodology or philosophy of science. And so you get... You know, Ludwig von Mises in his 1949 book, Human Action, is the most comprehensive um, development of uh, um, the economic methodology first laid out by, by Menger. It's called, uh, he calls it praxeology, the, the study of, of human action. Um, and then catalaxy is, is the study of exchange. That's the study of market exchange. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the core principles have pretty much stayed the same going back to Menger. Again, there's there's disagreements on certain margins, you know, about things like the notion of equilibrium and things like that. Uh, but but overall, it's those core propositions that uh, are, are at the core of things. But, but I will say this, you know, e even within those core kind of overarching themes and, and propositions that, that define the school and, and define the analysis of the Austrian tradition, you know, there, there's not perfect agreement. You know, how subjective are people? You know, you can be a radical subjectivist, um, or you can you can uh, 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 kind of have a, a more uh, uh, how should I put it? Uh, not not you know, you still appreciate subjectivism, but you don't say it, everything is so subjective so that we can say nothing about anything. Uh, and so there is that aspect of it as well. Um, and, but you know, the core propositions are are still define the school. I would say and still motivate the, the study of uh, uh, th all things Austrian economics. 
one thing I, I find interesting about Austrian economics is that um, they view costs as being subjective in a way that other schools of thought do not emphasize. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's crucial. And so so this goes back to, to something we had mentioned earlier. And one of the things that really defined Menger's view was this thoroughgoing subjectivism of, of all sides of things. And so Alfred Marshall, who was a very famous economist, um, he, he talked about supply and demand being like two blades of a scissor. And so um, you had subjective costs on the demand side, but objective costs on the supply side. So the costs facing production were, were objective costs, he, he argued, and, and, and many others. And what those in the Austrian tradition said is, no, wait a second. The people who produce things are also human beings. They also perceive the world a certain way, including how to use resources to produce goods and services. And the costs they associate with that, the opportunity cost, how else they could be using those resources is subjective. It's filtered through the human mind. So for the, the Austrian school and those working in that tradition, both the supply side and the demand side are subjective. Um, and, and one of the, the really great treatments of this for, for anyone who's interested is a very slim book called Cost and Choice by Nobel Lord James Buchanan, who had great sympathy and, and, and in many ways affiliations with the Austrian tradition, certainly on subjective costs. And what Buchanan points out is that cost is always linked to the moment of choice. And it is always in mind of the actor because opportunity costs the way that economists talk about it is foregone opportunity, which means it's never acted upon. So, so someone perceives the world, they can do A or B. When they pick A, they necessarily forego B, whatever that is. But it's never observable because it's never acted upon by definition. That's the foregone alternative. And so that's always subjective and it's only always, always known to the actor and no one else. And that has pretty radical implications for the way that we do economics, for the claims that we're able to make about things like costs and efficiency, uh, because you can never talk about costs just in accounting terms of monetary outlays. There's always opportunity cost. And once you buy into the idea that those are subjective, um, that has both implications analytically, but also for claims made about efficiency, observable efficiency, and so on. It also has implications for discussions about economic calculation and you know, the feasibility of uh, the government to centrally plan those types of decisions. So can we move on and talk about, a little bit about economic calculation? What does that mean? What does it require? And, and, and how is this uh, idea of economic calculation uh, so important to the Austrian school? Yeah, so, so the, what's called the calculation debate or the socialist calculation debate is another one of these moments where you really see the importance of the Austrian school in the evolution of economic theory and, and the economics discipline. And so the, the time period here we're talking about is the early 1900s. And what happened in that time period was there was a debate over the best means of organizing economic activity. And on the one hand, you had socialists, and on the other hand, you had proponents of uh, capitalism. Uh, now, just to clarify, because the, the term socialist today has a lot of kind of, it's very value laden and it's oftentimes used to, in a, in a, in a, it's kind of in a, in a derogatory sense by, by opponents of socialism. This wasn't an ideological debate. It was a purely technological, it was, excuse me, it was a purely theoretical debate about technological possibilities, which is what's the best way of using scarce resources. The socialists said, look, capitalism is inherently wasteful. It is subject to systematic market failures. Uh, there was a, a, a Marxist strand to this, meaning that one of the, the, the main failures of capitalism, in, in addition to things like business cycles and so on, was the exploitation of, of laborers, or so the argument went. Uh, and therefore, those activities that fell under the purview of capitalism could be centralized and controlled by a central planning board. So in the original manifestation of the, the socialist plan, you had the abolition of property rights over the means of production and the abolition of money. So there'd be no money and no property rights. You nationalize things. The government would tell people what to produce. They'd produce them, and then they would be distributed based on need. 
in order to make people better off. Uh, and uh, Mises came in and said, well, wait a second. There's a problem with this, which is how is the planning board going to make decisions about how to allocate scarce resources? How are they going to decide how to best use scarce resources to maximize their value? And this is where economic calculation came in. Um, calculation being the ability of economic actors to gauge the best use of scarce resources. So an example Mises gives is, you know, should we use platinum to build railroad tracks or for other uses? How do we make that determination? Well, the value of it, but how do you know the value of it absent a monetary price? And where does a, where does a monetary price come from? A monetary price comes from exchange uh, with money. And where does exchange come from? Well, you need property rights. So you have property rights allow for exchange. Exchange allows for the emergence of prices. And then prices allow people to judge alternative resource use uh, because they can say, well, the, the cost of that resource is too high. So I'm not going to pay for it to use it in this project because people want to use it in another project. And it's that process, that process of both the emergence of prices, uh, but also that knowledge that is communicated from price through prices that allows economic actors to engage in economic calculation and experimentation through markets. So it seems like that process of, of bidding resources away and competing with other people for those resources is really important for economic coordination. It's central to it. It's, it's really a question of what, what, what economists often call the economic problem, which is what are we going to produce? How are we going to produce it? And then how is it going to be distributed? And there's different ways to do that. The, again, the, the central planner said, well, experts can do it and they can do it better than market participants. But what Mises and then Hayek, Hayek came in the second stage of the debate, which we can talk about if, if, if you want to. But um, what they said was, well, wait a second, this, this knowledge is not predetermined and given to people. It emerges through the process of exchange, of, of market interactions, uh, and that that's the only way you can gain access to that knowledge. Uh, and so, so you're exactly right that it is an issue of coordination rather than allocation. Uh, in this chapter on economic calculation, you talk a bit about um, this example of somebody who wants to build a toaster from scratch, um, from beginning to end. Um, how does that illustrate some of the problems of trying to engage in economic coordination you know, from one person instead of through kind of a spontaneous order, division of labor? Yeah, so this is one of my favorite examples to capture the importance of coordination, calculation, and so on. And, and it's, it, it's an example that is, was provided by a, an inventor. His name is Thomas Thwaites. And he wrote a book called The Toaster Project, and he also did a TED Talk that that you know Google will, will find for you very quickly. It's 10 minutes, and it's one of my favorite examples of all this. And what, what Thomas Thwaites did is he said, look, he went to, to a store and he bought a very cheap toaster. So it's, it's like four or five pounds it cost him to purchase this toaster, a very low-end toaster. He took it apart. And when he takes it apart, he finds there's around 400 pieces to the toaster. Uh, and what he did is he tried to go around and and from from literally from the raw materials through the plastic casing of the toaster, he tried to reconstruct a basic toaster from scratch. And it was extremely time consuming and it didn't work. And so he you know it, it, the the TED video TED talk video is very funny because it's clips of him trying to 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 kind of build the the the, the you know sh smelt the plastic case and it's looks terrible and he plugs it in at the end and it shorts out in two seconds. Um, so he can't even toast any bread or anything. And his point is this, this basic item that we take for granted on our counter that we throw away when it stops working and just buy a new one is one of the most fascinating and complex inventions uh, when we actually start exploring everything that going into it, that goes into its production. And the fact that he isn't called the division of labor and special, uh, specialization, but the fact that specialization and division of labor make it available to us for relatively cheap prices is a truly amazing marvel uh, that we should appreciate more. Uh, at least that's what I take away from it. And, you know, other people have done these fascinating things, too. There's uh, someone named Andy George. He has a show called How to Make Everything. And, and several years ago, he tried to make a um, chicken sandwich from scratch. Uh, 
and uh, it took him months and months. And it cost like, I think it was $1,500 or maybe $2,000 around that. And again, it's funny to see these things in themselves because you see the person struggling to go through the process of making it. But you also realize again, all of the small things we take for granted that, that involve hundreds and thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of different people all coordinating and working together without knowing one another, without talking to one another. And it gets you and I and millions of other consumers around the world goods and services which improve our well-being with no one centrally directing it. And in fact, if you tried to centrally direct it, it would be a disaster. And that's one of the things that these examples, I think, highlight. When you try to get one person doing everything, it really ends up being a, being a mess. Well, in the book, I'm going to change gears a little bit and kind of ask you a little bit about the Austrian view of capital and, and how that matters, uh, the structure of capital, how that matters, and maybe a little bit about how that might relate to the Austrian business cycle theory, because that seems to be pretty relevant. Yeah. So, so, so starting from the basics, capital in general, or it, it, capital refers to intermediary goods that are used to produce a final consumer good. And one of the things, again, going back to Carl Menger in his, in his book, Principles of Economics in 1871, he introduced this taxonomy of goods. He called them higher order goods and lower order goods. And higher order goods are the initial goods, the goods of the earliest stages. And so the highest order good would be raw materials, for instance, when you first get them out of the ground. And then you do things to them and combine them and they move down, if you will, the structure of production to combine into lower order goods. And then the first order goods, the consumer good, the final good, whatever it is, the, the final toaster, for instance, that you and I purchase off the shelf. And so what that highlights is that producing goods and services most goods and services require a complex structure of production that needs to be undertaken in the correct set of steps. If you build the toaster casing before you have all the internal workings of the toaster, the toaster is not going to work. And if you don't have the raw materials to produce the different internal workings of the toaster, you can't produce all that stuff that goes on inside of it. And so all of that needs to take place in a certain set of sequential set of steps through time, and it needs to be coordinated. Who's going to do the coordinating? Entrepreneurs. How are entrepreneurs going to do the coordinating? Using economic calculation. At each point in that process, they have to determine if using those scarce resources, oftentimes in combination with other scarce resources, is the best use of those resources. Well, how do they determine that? Monetary prices and profit and loss. Um, or expected profit and loss. And so that's the idea of capital. The, the Austrian idea of capital is a capital is heterogeneous, meaning different. But uh, on top of that, it needs to be used together with other items in the structure of production. It's called complementarity. So you got to fit it together the right way. And it, it has multiple uses. So while it's heterogeneous, you can use steel for many different things. Steel is not plastic. Um, so those things are different. But within the realm of steel, you could use steel for many different production processes. You got to determine the best one to use it. So the example that Pete and I use in the book to kind of drive this point home is the Austrian theory of capital is much closer to, to Legos than it is to Plato. Plato being a ball you can just mush up and then reshape if you don't like um, how it looks, what you've made. Legos need to go together in a certain structure in order to produce the final product. And if you put a really small Lego at the bottom of the building, the building's gonna tip over. And so how does this relate to Austrian business cycle theory? Well, Austrian business cycle theory points out that uh, that capital structure is crucial to economic uh, processes. And when that capital structure gets distorted, production's gonna get distorted. And you say, well, how does the capital structure get distorted? Well, one way it can get distorted is through distortions to interest rates, which typically come through central banks uh, or, or, or heavily influenced by central banks, I should say. Uh, an interest rate reflects um, the cost of, of loanable funds. Um, so in order to borrow, I have to compensate people for foregoing their own consumption today because they're lending me resources. And on a market, you get a nat what's called the natural rate of interest. You would have suppliers and you would have demanders and their interactions would generate a, a price for loanable funds. What central banks can do, they don't have to do this, but they often do, is they distort that interest rate. 
uh, and they do it purposefully. Uh, they do it in order to stimulate economic activity or whatever their their goal is. But that has real consequences. Uh, and and in, in, in very simple terms, what it can do is this. When you lower the interest rate, entrepreneurs see a lower cost of borrowing funds. So projects that prior to the distortion wouldn't have appeared to be profitable now appear profitable on the margin. The, the marginal project that before would have been wouldn't have been cost feasible at the higher interest rate is now cost feasible from the perspective of the entrepreneur. They borrow the funds and they can utilize them to invest in a structure of production. The problem is that that change in the interest rate is not a genuine reflection of economic actors' genuine underlying preferences. So it, it, it is a distorted signal that the price of loanable funds is, is sending to entrepreneurs. And that leads to a, a distortion in the structure of production and can lead to a business cycle. So it seems like the way Austrians think about capital is incredibly different from how capital is discussed and modeled in mainstream economic conversations where you might walk away uh, with the conclusion that more capital is always better uh, regardless of the type of capital. Uh, so this strikes me as a really important conversation that a lot of economic students are, are missing out on if they're not yeah. studying Austrian. Yep, I think that's exactly right. I mean, in most macroeconomic or growth models, capital enters into the equation as, you know, capital K. Um, capital is capital is capital. Um, and, and this matters, of course, in general. But one of the areas that really matters a lot is in for, for people interested in economic development. And so one of the things that development economists have done for a long time is said, well, capital is really important. And then they'll have a model and they'll say, well, they just need more physical capital, for instance. Well, maybe. But even if that's the case, uh, there's an important question, which is what type of, of physical capital? Uh, a, a hospital building is not the same as a school building, is not the same as a road, uh, is not the same as, as uh, you know, an office building. Uh, and, and so then you have to make determinations about how that capital is going to be allocated. And then typically what you get is ec development experts who do it. Well, what is this reminiscent of? Central planning. It is the experts know how capital should be allocated. But if you go back to where you and I started our conversation, you say, well, really what matters is the perceptions of the people who live in the system. Then it's the people in these societies that are being intervened upon whose valuations matter. But oftentimes they're kind of left out of the equation of making judgments about how those resources should be allocated. And so as you, as you put it quite correctly, in my view, this more nuanced view of capital with a focus on heterogeneity of complementarity of the structure of production and fitting things together through time, all coordinated through an overarching set of institutions and guideposts that are guiding entrepreneurs and economic actors is really central to this market process. Let's turn to the market process and spontaneous order because um, I think spontaneous order is one of those concepts that I think is very difficult for a lot of people to grasp. Um, and the idea that the market is a process and not this kind of snapshot in time also seems to, to kind of speak to the spontaneous order nature of how markets actually work. Yeah, and, and so the idea of the market process the, first of all, a market is simply an interaction between buyers and sellers. So that's just a general terminological or definitional issue, which is important because people talk about the market as if somehow it's this entity absent people that can be controlled. This is, again, why it's important never to separate economic analysis from human choosers, because markets are inherently interactions between human beings, and we should never forget that. The market process, the process part of this is meant to emphasize that it is a, a interactive process between people that generates the outcomes. Those outcomes cannot exist absent that process. The reason this is important is because many people, and, and this is something Hayek emphasized coming out of the calculation debate. So Hayek was very confused coming out of the calculation debate, which by the way, Mises and Hayek were viewed as losing in the profession. And the reason Hayek was confused was because what happened was Mises made his critique of socialism and then the market socialist came in and the market socialist said, Mises is right. We need prices and we need property, but not over everything. 
And what we can do is simply mimic perfect competition. And so we can have a central planning board that instructs firms to simply satisfy the conditions of perfect competition, just like we teach economic students and principles of economics. Price equals marginal cost. You minimize average uh, total cost and you get economic efficiency, allocative efficiency. That, that is all mutually beneficial exchanges have been exhausted. You can do no better. And Hayek said, well, wait a second. This is a very odd notion of competition because no one's actually competing. It is a static state. It's an end state. Uh, once you've hit that point of economic efficiency, there's nothing else to do because there's no other gains uh, from exchange to be had. So there's two things Hayek pointed out. One is that those cost curves, which include, again, accounting costs and economic costs, uh, which means that it includes opportunity cost, uh, are not known to people. They have to be discovered. Second of all, uh, the process through which people discover those things is an active process of competition. So Hayek always talked about competition as a process, ongoing process rather than an end state. And so one of the things that economics often gets accused of is this mo of, of, of subscribing to, you know, the, one of the critiques, the, the straw man critiques is, uh, of Econ 101 is, uh, you know, perfect competition. Economists believe in perfect competition. Well, perhaps, uh, but there's certainly one tradition that doesn't emphasize that, which is the Austrians. And the Austrians emphasize the need for markets precisely because we don't know. And markets allow us to discover that through entrepreneurship. That's uh, what I think Vernon Smith calls that ecological rationality. The system is smart, not necessarily. Uh, the actor doesn't need all the information. The system provides it. Um, now, is the spontaneous order, is that always gonna result in kind of a beneficial outcome or, or what might determine, I can think of maybe things like uh, tragedy of the commons or some examples where this process of a spontaneous order would lead to something that's maybe socially harmful. Sure, and that's a great point. So, so first of all, so a spontaneous order is an order that is the result of purposeful human action, but not design. So no one sits down and designs. It's an unintended consequence of other behavior that is purposeful. And the idea of spontaneous order has a long history. Uh, uh, you know, prior to Menger, the the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, so Adam Smith, David Hume, Adam Ferguson, all of these thinkers emphasized the importance of these emergence or spontaneous orders. And what they highlighted, among other things, was that these orders are uh, uh, self-generating and often self-sustaining without anyone designing them. The market, or the market process, I should say, is both the result of spontaneous orders, but also generates a spontaneous order. The, the standard example being, well, if you walk into a grocery store and just step back and, and marvel at how all these things got on the shelf without any central planner telling anyone to put them there and to produce them, that's a spontaneous order. So then we come to the point you raised, which is an important one, which is, well, are all spontaneous orders beneficial. And of course, spontaneous orders just don't have to be market outcomes. They can be legal outcomes. They can be social outcomes uh, uh, and so on. And the answer is no. There is nothing in the theory of spontaneous order that has any normative content, meaning there's nothing in the theory itself that says whether the outcome is good or bad. Uh, and so let me give you, you know, you raised the tragedy of the commons, which is a great example. Another example of this is um, from Thomas Schelling, who's a Nobel laureate, and he has um, this checkered board model of discrimination. And what he showed is that with very weak assumptions, so you don't have to assume that everyone is a strong racist, just that they have a preference to a, a slightly strong preference to live among people that are similar to them. You can get segregation in a neighborhood um, without anyone planning it centrally. And whether you judge that to be good or bad depends on your normative benchmark. And so we need some other benchmark to judge the goodness or, or badness of spontaneous orders. What spontaneous orders do is simply highlight that many aspects of the social world emerge and are not the result of human design and can generate desirable outcomes, but they don't have to. That's dependent on, on how you evaluate them. So we're almost out of time today, and I, I want to thank you for 
kind of summarizing some of the, the big key points of our essential Austrian economics book. Um, and I want to continue this conversation next time uh, and get into interventionism and the planning and power problem because those things seem like they would be incredibly relevant in today's world. Um, so, so I would love to thank you for, for joining us today and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Essential Scholars, a new podcast series that explores the ideas and insights of some of history's most influential thinkers. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe and head over to essentialscholars.org to learn more. See you next time. Thank you.